Hello, and welcome to Autism Ontario's webinar, Building Friendships Through Playdates. Our presenter today is Leslie Cohen. Leslie Cohen has been working with children and adults diagnosed with ASD for over 19 years in the United States and Canada. She specializes in helping caregivers effectively support people with ASD through creative, positive, science-based interventions. She's a licensed psychologist in the state of New York and a board-certified behavior analyst at the PhD level. Dr. Cohen is currently the clinical director of LNA Educational Services. Just before we get to our presentation today, there's a few housekeeping details to go over. Uh, this presentation is a slide-based presentation, so you should be seeing slides at the center of your screen and hearing audio to go along with it. There will be no video component for this presentation. Uh, next to the slides at the center of your screen on the right side, you should see a resource list. Here's where you'll find resources related to this presentation from Autism Ontario. On the left side of the screen, there is a Q&A box. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question, just type your question into this box and we will receive it on our end. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a live question and answer period with Dr. Leslie Cohen and we'll endeavor to answer as many of those questions as possible. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Leslie Cohen. Well, I'm really excited to be talking to everybody today about building friendships through playdates because if I could think of one thing that we could all do for children with autism to give them some happiness and self-esteem, it is the incredible amount of work involved in structuring positive social interactions with peers of any age at any time in their lives. So let's get ready to do that. I'm not going to pretend it's easy and that there isn't work involved for parents because there is a lot of setup, but the payoffs are enormous for kids. So um, the first thing we want to say about getting ready is most of the time you really do have to get ready because a lot of planning and structure will make a play date more successful. When your kid is confident and they already have a few friends, sometimes you just don't need all of that structure anymore, but at the beginning it's a really good idea. Um, and when the play dates work, the, the confidence they get from having a friend and having somebody over to their house really carries over to their interactions in the community and at school. So one of the first things parents ask me when we talk about setting up play dates for kids is they say, well, where am I going to get these kids? How am I going to find the right kids so my kids can practice uh, their social skills? And here are just some quick ideas about what we can do with that. We want to have, first of all, if there are any siblings or relatives or cousins who are nice and, and uh, you can use, that is absolutely a great way to go because being able to practice within the family and get a little better at social, some of the basic social skills can be really helpful so that things go well when you're with a kid that you don't know very well. And then one thing that's hard for parents to do but pays off a lot, a huge amount, and it, like I say, it's work, is building relationships with other parents through whatever community groups. It could be other parents of children with needs. It could be parents of neurotypical kids. It could be uh, the parents of kids at drop-off or at pick-up, um, having parents over for or meeting for coffee, carpooling, and uh, helping out with school events. These are great ways to build a relationship with other parents because when you build relationships with other parents, they're going to feel, feel very comfortable having your kid have a play date with their kid. And then observing kids at school or on the playground or during other activities such as swimming and sports can really help you identify the good plate partners for your child. So if your child's involved in an event, getting there a few minutes early so you can quietly watch and see what do those interactions look like, uh, it can help you a lot to figure out which kids are going to work out. At school, you're not always able to observe kids very much, so asking school staff, coaches, and group leaders with whom you're, who is your child already interested in playing with. And then offering to ferry kids to events or take the whole group for, out for a treat after an activity is a great way to build relationships. 
So now we're talking about trying to figure out which kids are the best for your kid. And one of the things I want to be encouraging about is having play dates is the best way to figure that out and creating these social opportunities because they don't always all work out. So kind of giving yourself permission that not every play date is going to go perfect. That's why we always say start with short ones. So if a kid isn't really a match for your kid, you can say, okay, moving on, just move on. Um, it might not be perfect at first. Sometimes kids who are a few steps ahead of your kid can be great role models if they share interests with your child. So it could be a child who's slightly older. But personalities really matter. Kids with a good sense of humor, kids who are tolerant, kids who lead the play, um, if, if a kid is not quite sure what the steps in the play are, they all have something to offer. See who your kids are like. Some kids seem to clash and fight all the time, but they learn to get along because they just like each other. And I've seen that happen many, many times. I've seen kids with ADHD who, like other kids who are like making immature jokes all the time, and, and parents and teachers go, this can't work forever because they're not really role models for each other, and when they get into fights, they can't solve it. And I've seen some of those kids remain friends for years, and they do make up because they like hanging out together. Of course, for you, it will be easiest to start with kids who are pretty well-regulated. So if there's a kid who tantrums a lot or yells and screams a lot or has trouble modulating things like hitting and breaking things, that's probably not where we want to start. Okay, a lot of times when we're trying to figure out who our kid could play with, sometimes we have little internal rules that may come from our own childhood that really don't matter that much to our kids. And it's good to think about that a little bit because there are actually a lot of potential fits that seem to work better for kids that maybe aren't what we would expect or think, okay, that's going to be good. For example, many, 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 many of the kids who I've worked with over the years are more comfortable with kids who are either distinctly a little bit younger or a little bit older than they are when they can't seem to match up with the kids who are exactly the same age. And that's fine. Sometimes boys are better for girls and girls are better for boys than same gender, which is so emphasized in schools, you know, the same gender play. And kids often select that for themselves. But if kids don't, uh, those can be really great matches. Um, other kids with special needs, if they're a good fit, are excellent play partners and often very, very forgiving. So I think that that's a really good choice as a way to get started. Um, and a lot of times we think, oh, well, I have to have, I have to have a kid who doesn't have ASD for my kid because they're going to be a perfect role model. But actually, so many of the things that your kid is learning they can learn with another kid who has a learning disability or ADHD or ASD, learning to take turns, learning to wait. Those things are not, you have to have a, a typical peer in order to do that. Okay. I think one of my biggest frustrations as a clinician supporting kids with autism is how often I run into the idea that kids with ASD and all kids are going to somehow learn by osmosis being together in giant packs. And a lot of times you see that at school just because of the structure, which requires that teachers take their break when kids are at recess. It's really a structural need that doesn't map that well onto how children with ASD who have tremendous social anxiety learn to socialize. Uh, in my case, uh, over-supporting kids and actually helping them play over and over and over again has worked so much better for both the kids on my list with ADHD, social anxiety, and with ASD. So I don't expect them to learn to play with another kid by osmosis. Uh, this could be the biggest challenge they face in their lives, so I'm there ready to back off if things are going well, but I'm ready to be there and jump in if they need a little help. Kids with ASD have been shown to do much better when play activities are organized and very structured and when there is some adult support until they have gained their own confidence to play with peers on their own. They'll let us know. When they don't need us, they walk away. When they don't need us, they say, hey, can we just play in the by ourselves? Can you? They'll tell us. So um, play partners coming into an unfamiliar setting 
will also benefit from this structure and initial guidance from a helpful adult. All kids are still learning to have successful social interactions and relationships. And a little extra help when you're frustrated because a toy isn't working or when you guys can't decide who's going to go first is actually very beneficial to all kids. So now we're talking about how to plan the activities, and um, it's really, really good to have a plan. Uh, camps are a really good example of places where kids go to play all summer, and they're very, very tight in their structure, usually organization of kids' time and making sure that they have a plan. One of the things that plans do is they reduce downtime. You'll see that sort of down at the bottom of the list, and that's something that's the hardest thing where you're most likely, like if a kid is going to have an odd behavior that another kid would notice, it's usually when they're trying to manage downtime when they feel there's nothing to do and they're not sure what their role is. So if we have everything, a nice tight little plan, we may change our plan. Maybe one of the activities is going so well that you don't need to move on to another activity. That's great. You have too many activities. Who cares? Don't do one of them. It's fine. But if we don't have a structure and one of the activities isn't working well, we might be struggling to figure out, what could I move on to? This isn't working. How can I get kids quickly reorganized? <coughs> so what are the components? We want to have a good structure. And what do we mean by structure? It's not like we're going to build a tower of play. What we mean is that we want to have different spaces worked out where kids are going to do different things in some kind of natural progression. A really good starting structure is to go like, okay, I know in the middle of the play date we're going to have a snack. That would be a structuring element. At some point we're going to have this snack. We're going to do something at the beginning. Maybe we're going to do an art thing at the beginning. You start to figure out, what do I want to do at the beginning? What do I want to do in the middle? What do I want to do at the end? And we want to make sure that those things are fun for both kids. We want to make the play date short to start out with. I know 30 minutes sounds impossible. Poor parents. Who's going to drop off their kid for 30 minutes? Well, if you pick up the kid and drop them off, that's a way to get that 30-minute play date. And also it's easy to do if you're going to meet up at the park because everybody can go after that. Um, and 30 minutes is a really good way to test out a, a kid if you can work it out. It, let's say a parent has to drop their kid off for longer but you know that your kid can only manage probably for 30 minutes, you could do something where at the end of the 30 minutes everybody's watching a movie until the parent comes back, something like that where there's less social interaction and less pressure. Um, we want to make sure that we've created opportunities for the kids to interact. So a uh, worst-case scenario is we're going to come and play computer games and nobody interacts. Um, a mix of physical, interactive, and quiet activities activities that your child is already really good at, and make sure you end the play date on a high note. We talked about reducing downtime. So here we have a, a simple plan sample that we've used tons with kids that's worked out pretty well. So we just want to share it with you and say this is a structure that's worked, and I'll just unpack it a little bit because some of these things are just things we made up names for, so you might not know what they are. So the first thing is going to pick up your friend. Maybe we, right after we pick them up, we're going to all have a snack together. And then we have an art project here called Paper Mosaics. I'm just going to explain that to you. One of the reasons Antoinette chose Paper Mosaics is because it's something that can be structured. So what it would be is like, let's say we're going to do a paper mosaic of a little boat. She will have uh, drawn a picture of a boat in, in black on a piece of paper and have cut paper shapes that can be glued in different colors into the outlines of that boat. That way, if my kid doesn't have really great fine motor for drawing, they don't have to compare themselves. All the boats are going to look pretty similar, except the kids will choose different colors. And I'm not saying everybody should have to do paper mosaics, but if you want them, you can let Autism Ontario know and we can supply you with a few samples. I think we supplied them in the workshop. But what we're talking about is, okay, when we're thinking about that art project, how can we make it into something that our kid is not going to have a negative comparison between themselves and the other kid? Make sure that they can do it and that it's something they'll be satisfied with the look of when they're done. 
So we moved from that art project, which is kind of regulating, getting used to each other. We had a snack together. Paper mosaic's pretty quiet. You don't have to interact that much. And then we went for backyard games. So this is the height of socializing, the middle of the play date when there's going to be a lot of social interaction. So we're going to go on a treasure hunt, put the kids on a team, let them look together, um, go uh, do a circuit where we might uh, do do like a gymnastic circuit where we walk uh, over and under tables and go on a, I don't know if it's nice outside, we might do some splash pad type activities in the backyard and then move to another station where there are balls to kick in a net. Uh, we might play water balloon toss and catch or throw. <laughs> and then, um, okay, we did that and we had a lot of socializing, so now we want to calm down a little bit. So we have here making fruit fizzes. That's a very structured thing we might do in the kitchen where we uh, grind up fruit and add you know, soda pop to it or seltzer water and make a nice cool beverage to calm ourselves down after being outside and cool off. Then we have board games, which is not as big an outside sort of getting kids all aroused as playing in the backyard. And how do we make it work? We'll talk about that later. And then we have another group activity led that an adult can really push in on. This thing is called Bippity Boppity Boo, but it's just an example of games like Duck Duck Goose that you could play on the floor inside and take turns doing. So Bippity Boppity Boo, you just get anything and call it a magic wand, and the person who's the leader has the wand and says, Bippity Boppity Boo, now you are a monkey. And everybody, the person, everybody in the group has to be whatever animal they say, and then they pass the wand along to the next person, and they get to make everybody do something else. And then we have goodbyes and taking your friend home. So let's take a look at a play date plan for a little bit older kid. This is a kid who's seven years or older. We're still going to pick up their friend. That's the first activity. We still are going to have a snack, but in this case, we're working with the kids together to pack up snacks to take maybe to the park or um, to some other outdoor place where we're going to ride bikes or scooters to go get there. So when they're packing up snacks, the part of the organization might be for your kid to organize before the kid arrives a bunch of baskets with different snacks in it so that it's easy for them and their friend to pick stuff and put it in their backpack. Um, we might ride bikes or scooters to the park and then engage in some organized sport games like playing horse. I don't know if you've played horse when you were young, but that's the kind of basketball where you go to a station, stand there, and try and shoot the ball. And if you shoot it and you get it in, you get to move on. If you don't, if you shoot it and you miss it, you get a letter. And when it spells horse, you're out. And it's just super structured, and it doesn't involve a lot of running back and forth and coordinated action, so it works pretty well if kids are not so good with that. Modified baseball, t-ball, football, hockey, and tail tag. What's tail tag? Tail tag's a great way to get kids not to touch each other inappropriately while they're playing tag. So if you give everybody a tail on a little piece of Velcro or tuck a tail into their pants when they're running around, if you're the person who's it, your job is to grab the tail, not the person. And it helps kids learn, okay, I'm not going to tackle that person. I'm just going to grab the tail. And it's lots of fun. Who doesn't want to have a tail? Then we have refreshments, uh, riding back to the house, playing some port board games, construction or art at a more mature level, and goodbyes. Okay, we want to brainstorm the play date. It's often good to just treat it like an assignment and get yourself a piece of paper and just start throwing your ideas down to ask yourself these basic questions to make sure you feel confident and comfortable and you feel like you've made the best plan you can. And after a while, the stuff starts to come naturally. You don't have to do that. You sort of automatically play, plan these play dates. You really get a feel for it with different kinds of kids, what's going to work. But I find giving myself a chance to think, think it through makes the play date go more smoothly. So you want to make an activity plan. We showed you a few of those. What's going to happen first, second, third, fourth? What are your backup activities? What if something really bombs with the kids? What have you got in your pocket? that you can throw at it so that they still can keep spending pleasurable time together. How long will your play date last? And sometimes you have to get control of other parents because it happens all the time that parents don't pick up their kids on time because they're just parents. You know, if you had a chance to get a cup of coffee and uh, get a little bit of the shopping done, you'd do it. So sometimes parents get immersed in those things and they're late and your play date is going south. So having something that the kids can do like watch a movie 
or picking up the kid and dropping them off so there's no opportunity for the parent to not show up on time, those are really good ways to protect yourself from having that happen. Um, how will you end it on a high note? So basically, we want the other kid to feel like, wow, I had a really great time. Something really great happened. And how do you end on high note? Like That might sound really abstract, but I can tell you some things that kids really love. Like having something that they made that they take away to take home with them that that's there that they did, like either they found something during the treasure hunt and you gather that up into a special bag. That's something that's pretty exciting. Taking a picture of the pictures of the kids having a great time on one of the activities, like we have these two kids in the photograph on sled, so if they're doing something they're really excited about, memorializing it in some way and just taking a photo and showing it to them, those things can be a really high note for kids. Um, some kids really want, they have a very particular favorite activity and putting that at the end because that's the thing they're going to remember and talk to their parents about. Does it work for you and does, does it work for the other parent? So um, what that means is have you scheduled it at a time and place where it really fits your schedule and you won't be stressed and have you made it work for the other parents so that uh, you know they're not just dropping their kid for 15 seconds and coming right back? All right. So now we've got a great plan, we've got great activities, we've picked a great kid, maybe a relative to start with, and we want to make sure our kid is ready. And on that very day, just before the kid's over, many of you have been in a situation where your kid is just in a rotten mood or your kid is tantruming or having a rigidity or something's going on. So we want to show you some ways that you can make sure that by the time the kid gets there, your kid's ready. So one of the strongest techniques, there are many, many techniques. There's another technique called mood induction where you make sure your kid's doing a mildly enjoyable activity that's not something they're obsessed about right before the other kid comes. That's a good technique. But I want to talk about priming. And priming means that you want to make sure your child is familiar with the structure of the play date and the materials before the other kid shows up. You can tell your kid, hey, you're the host. Let's let's have a pretend play date uh, before we have a real one so you guys could do one the day before. Or you could say, let's have a five-minute play date where we go through each one of these things together and have a little bit of fun with it before your friend comes. So they feel like, I know what's going to happen. I'm not anxious. I know exactly what I'm going to do on my play date. Uh, practicing some of the activities in advance and practicing some of the social interactions that will occur at key times during the play date, such as sharing materials, making a comment, giving a compliment, responding when someone else says something to you, and greetings. So practicing those things a little bit, I like to do priming right before the event. So I might practice just a few of those things, like giving a comp comment or compliment, not try and do them all, but just a few minutes before the other kid shows up so that my kid has remembers it and sometimes if you prime too early the kid forgets it okay so visual structure can really help lower your child's anxiety but it can also help the other kid we use activity schedule books for play dates for kids all the time and i've had many many typical kids who've come to one of our play dates say to me at the end of the play date can you teach my mom how to make a schedule book so i have more stuff to do at home because it's boring. So they're so excited that there's all these things to do and they know what order they're going to happen in. They want one too. So having a little book like that where there are photographs, it, it tends to end fights like whose turn is it to choose what we do? I don't want to do that. It's your turn. That can add a lot of structure. We use building schedules. We use schedules for cooking, which look a lot like a visual cookbook. You can even buy those now. There are organizations even in Ontario where people have made cooking their specialty, and they've made all of these photographic recipes. Um, choice boards with photographs on them so kids can pick what they want to do. And that will help kids, even through activities like knowing what prizes there are, can create a big social interaction. When they look at all the photographs of these different prizes, it gives them something to talk about. Um, and it can give turn-taking support, like in songs and games. If we have all the songs up on the board and they say, well, you get to choose one of these, and then I say, well, now you get to choose one of these, the visual structure ends the fight, and the same for games. And then it helps to have materials management. 
baskets and stations, and you can use step-by-step arrangement. What if you didn't take all these photographs of how you're going to cook? You can just set all the ingredients out like Martha Stewart, so every single step is laid out in order, and kids will follow it like a schedule. So let's take a look at a, a, a little visual choice board that we might use with kids on a play date. We might say, uh, if Joe is coming over to the house, we might say, hey, Joe, here's some of the stuff we have to do. And I'll have the kids tell me every single one. One of the reasons why is a lot of kids with autism may have an obsessive focus, and they might see that computer screen down there and go, yeah, I want to do the computer. And they might not attend to all the other choices. So I usually try to have everybody read them out. What is this? Oh, we're going to play... Uh, um, we're going to play, uh, we're going to do dancing, we're going to play street hockey, we're going we're gonna to play music, we could play musical chairs, we could go to the playground, and I'll t have them touch each picture and talk about it, or I will. So they get this whole idea, this is what's out there, this is the array. Then we can go to turn taking and say, hey, Joey, you get to go first, which of these things do you want to do? And then if it's my child, Mary's turn, I'll say, Mary, you get to pick something now. And so the visual thing sets the structure, and I find that kids always get very excited because a lot of times they have trouble thinking, what is there that I could do? And the choice board will tell them. So here we have a construction schedule, and we're just using this as a model of how, what if your kid uh, doesn't know exactly how to build stuff, or you could use it with something like cooking that both kids don't know how to do, or if they're constructing something uh, sophisticated like a marble speedway or something from Lego, it's a pictorial way of kind of getting them to take turns and showing them exactly what step they're on. Um, I like software like Pictello, which is very inexpensive and can run on a cell phone or a tablet that helps you build these schedules. However, you can do it in uh, in a PowerPoint presentation, you don't have to print out all these photos, but they are very, very helpful. I, a lot of times I do print them out. So let's take a look at this one for construction. And it looks like Joey set out the first block in our structure. And Mary took her turn. And here's the third block. And here's the fourth block. It's really starting to look like something. And here's here is the top. Our castle is complete. We often make a hooray slide or some slide that says wow or something, and it serves two purposes. One is it serves as a reinforcer to say, wow, look at the work we've done. But there's another reason, too. Many kids with autism don't actually know when we're done. That's why they feel more comfortable with closed-ended activities, like when you do a puzzle, there are no more blocks and there are no more pieces and you know you're done. So the hooray slide tells our kid, that's it, our structure is complete. Um, so that can be very helpful, and then we can get out toys or knock the structure down or run run cars through it, whatever we want to do, and this is just a signal that we're done with the building component. Um, and uh, another thing I want to say is there's a software called Pictello that's very inexpensive that is really excellent for schedule building. It makes it very, very easy to do. And another thing you can do is just drop photos into PowerPoint and just show it on a tablet or an iPad or whatever. So your schedules don't all, you don't have to be printing photos all the time to get this stuff to work. So now that you've become masters of some elements of a play date, we want to think again about what have we done to try to create opportunities to interact. If you work with an SOP, you'll always hear them using words like temptations, like make a temptation for someone to speak or make a temptation for them to communicate. And we want to really think about, have I done everything I could to create opportunities that really push for interaction? So let's take a look at some just some little ideas to get you started that um, I, I've done myself, I've done with 
occupational therapists and speech language pathologists. This first thing of mixing puzzles, it's worked really, really well. I owe this to my dear friend, uh, Denise from Massachusetts. She's a speech and language pathologist in the school district there. And she was the first one who I ever saw just taking two two puzzles and, and taking apart all the pieces and putting them together and having one kid start, like, you know, if it was, his puzzle was a dog and the other one was a zebra, he would have to get the dog pieces from the other kid. And while they were fishing around in the pile, when he found one of the zebra, he would hand it to the other kid and he would get the pieces for the dog. So there was an automatic collaboration and sharing that was pretty nonverbal, so it wasn't very high pressure. But instead of just saying, that's mine, that's mine, it, it pushed a little bit on collaboration and eye contact and sharing. We do the same thing with art materials, like if we have art materials and, you know, I've got some colors on my side of the table and you've got some colors on your side of the table, if you need yellow, then you need to ask me for it. And it gives me an opportunity to give it to you and make eye contact with you. And if I then need purple, I can make an exchange. So having different materials on either side or within the reach of each one of the kids can push a little on that. We do the same thing with cooking by assigning roles. Like if I'm the person who's doing the stirring, then I can say, okay, drop the egg now. I'm ready. And it, it, as long as I, you have a specific role, like you're the egg cracker and dropper and I'm the stirrer, we have different opportunities to acknowledge one another and ask somebody to do something or to do their step right now. Making a video together, it's a fantastic way to assign people different roles so that they're interacting. Um, I remember one of the first Playdate movies I ever made. I've made so many now. It's hard for me to remember all the hits, but one that really worked out well was we had this movie called Skateboarders from Outer Space. And um, I was helping my nephew who has ADHD, and uh, you know he was having trouble with his friendships, although he really wanted to have friends. And this skateboard movie from Outer Space, both kids were so jazzed to be on videotape that I could tell them, like, okay, the, the skateboarder from out, Outer Space, it's time for you. Uh, your friend fell off a skateboard and he hurt his ankle and you have to bandage it and you have to ask him where it hurts, figure it out, and get him back up on his skateboard so that they could actually help each other in the video as part of the role and part of the script. And it was very, very, very helpful. Um, and then uh, things like bowling and t-ball where we have a naturally defined role. So if we're bowling... I'm, I could be the person who's bowling. I could be the person who's setting the pins for the next player, and we can switch. If it's t-ball, uh, I know if I'm the person at bat. I know if I'm in the outfield what my role is. I know if I'm pitching. I know what my role is. And a lot of times when we play t-ball, we like to have some fun stuff for people to do so there's not too much downtime. So let's say you're in the outfield and somebody's hitting, and it gets kind of boring just being in the outfield like for three or four turns. So then we go, okay, when the hitter hits, we're all going to run the bases together. So the whole group does something, so there's always something to do in t-ball. It can be kind of fun. Another thing that we like to do is we like to have kids ganging up on the adults. And that may sound overwhelming, but if you just have one other kid for over for a play date, um, that can be really, really fun. And I want to tell you some of the ways that we do it. For example, if um, we're playing even something very simple like a card game, We'll put the two teams, the two kids on a team together and make them try to beat us. And we'll make a bunch of goofy mistakes so that they do beat us. Uh, we'll do it in basketball too. We'll yuck it up and act like we're really going to beat the tar out of them and then we'll like fall over and uh, they'll be the only people scoring. So instead of fighting with each other, they're together as a team to try to take us on. And that is a really nice way to um, create some social opportunities. So in my long time working with kids with different kinds of needs, I've had to learn a lot about regulation over time because I was always the kind of behavior therapist from the get-go who just wanted to squeeze the juice out of a kid every time I went for a therapy session because I wanted the kid to get their money's worth. I wanted the parent to get their money's worth. So when I was there, I wanted that kid to learn everything I could possibly teach them in the minutes, hours, whatever that I had with them. And I realized that actually you know, over time and through very many other wonderful therapists I've worked with, that, that kids are kind of like on-off. They make a social push, and then they go sometimes through kind of a, 
I don't know what you would call it, a refractory period where they just want to be alone for a little bit or making less eye contact for a little bit. And that's true of typical kids as well as kids with ASD. They can't go full bore all the time. So um, playdates can work very, very well if we actually take that into account and say, well, during the course of this playdate, there are going to be some activities that are super social, but there are other ones that are going to just take the pressure off. So it's just like having a break from socializing, but you guys are still together. And how are we going to do that? without making it seem like an antisocial play date. Well, I'm here to give you some tips about how to do that. So we can have activities that the kids are together, but it is more like par- parallel play because they don't have to interact that much. So, for example, if we're going for a bike ride on the way to the park, we might be riding one in front of the other, or we might be riding next to each other, but most kids are not talking and making eye contact while they're riding a bike because they're going to get in an accident if they do that. So it's a, it's a good way to install a break. When we're going sledding, the same thing. We could be taking turns. We could be going down hill, the hill together. But there's not a huge pressure to have a giant conversation about what does your dad do for a living when you're going down an icy sled down a hill. Things that have a large sensory component where kids can get lost in their own creation, watercolor, sandbox, water table, car wash, these things are social because we're doing the same stuff together, but they don't require a lot of talking. If you don't feel like talking at that moment, you can still be playing and do it. We like to have activities that anybody can do successfully and just have a good time. Anybody can jump into a pile of leaves. You don't need a special play skill to do it, but it sure is a lot of fun. And anybody can roll down a hill, walk down, walk up a hill and roll down. And these kinds of things kids love doing, and they love doing it together, but it doesn't have this constant pressure on eye contact, joint attention, and talking. So having those moments can be good. And then we like to create shared experiences. I love to photograph shared experiences so that the kids can see it later, Um, like when they're at the splash pad together. Well, when kids are at the splash pad, they're not always talking to each other. Sometimes they're screaming, like kids are screaming at the splash pad all the time, but they're not always saying, oh, you know, what movie did you go to this week? No, they're jumping in the water. Um, having, watching a movie together or going to the movies. Kids are looking at the movie and they're experiencing it together, but they don't have to always talk and make eye contact. When we're going on an expedition, um, like if we're in, we're going out for an ice cream, we're having a wonderful shared experience, but it doesn't have this huge pressure on eye contact and conversational skill. So during the play date, you may still have to prompt your child and even coach the peer in getting interactions going. And you have to find kind of casual language to do that that doesn't sound clinical or weird. Like, oh, I think you would like it if you asked him for a turn or if you asked him to come over and do what you're doing. You can use really casual language, but you might have to do some prompting. Um, And it's important to focus on shifting children from interacting with you to interacting with each other. That sounds great, but how do we do it? I do it the same way I train therapists. Like most behavior therapists, we love to have all the toys, all the good stuff, because we want to reward behavior. But I like to give the good stuff to the person who's going to try to interact. So if I give an interesting pair of toys, like let's say I give two so there's no fight, like let's say I have a fantastic bubble wand, I'll get two of them, and I'll give them to the person who came from the play date, and I said, oh, I think he would like it if you gave him one. Well, he has that now, and so my kid is going to interact with him. Or I might do that with my son. If my son has autism and he's hosting a play date, I might give him both bubble ones and say, oh, I think Johnny would like one. And then that, then I'm prompting him to go to Johnny and offer him something. Instead of me being the source of all of the toys, I let the kids be the source of the toys, and that really helps me. If somebody's passing out great treats like uh, cupcakes, I'm not going to pass those out. I'm going to have the kids give it to each other. Um, Telescoping is a super helpful technique. That's why we made a slide of a telescope where parents insert themselves into the play situation to solve problems or to break the ice and support interaction and then fade back as soon as the kids are interacting well. I remember uh, one of the longest trips I ever took. I was going to Seattle with my nephew who has ADHD. He was going to... 
um, a wonderful school for kids with ADHD where I was going as an intern and he was going for the summer program. And on the train, he so desperately wanted to play card games with the other kids and he was so shy he couldn't do it. So I remember hours and hours of going down to the lounge and starting up games like Uno. Uh, sometimes they lasted until the middle of the night because on the train, no parent cares if their kid goes to bed. And I would start these giant games and I would just fade very quickly, like within 10 minutes, once the thing got started, the kids really didn't need me anymore. So I would just sit back and then I would start doing my computer work and gradually I would head back to my seat. But the hard thing for him was getting it started and I still needed to get it started. It happened a lot. So look look out for downtime, look out for activities that aren't working and look out for communication failure. So communication failure might be, what if I say something really direct to a kid, like um, uh, let's say I say something like, that hat's stupid. That is really like, I might be trying to have a conversation with that person, but if I'm really visual and I have ASD, I'm noticing the hat, I'm really focused on the hat. So if something like that happens, you want to be there to help your kid rework it or smooth it over and say, you know, he might say, but I like I like it because it makes me laugh. And try and turn it around into something positive and say, hey, I'm going to get a silly hat and see if I can make you laugh. Like these little moments where you can rewrite the ship, that's what we're there for. So it's it's really funny because usually when we're dissecting things we're dissecting things because a kid had a meltdown so anytime a kid has a big behavior problem like uh you know they flopped and they screamed and cried at school we all get together all the staff get together and we go you know what happened what started it how can we prevent it next time do we do the right thing and it's very funny to be asking all of you as parents to do that when you've had a play date i want you to go back and look at it and say, ask yourself a lot of questions about it because you want to get rid of the stuff that didn't work and try to figure out what you need for next time, what worked and what do you need for next time. So let's see some of the questions I ask myself after a play date. I go, the first thing I ask myself, did I end it at the right time? Were the kids still interacting and not exhausted with one another when I ended it? Were there enough opportunities for the peers to interact with each other? Did both kids have fun? Was it a positive experience for you, meaning the parent? Did I have a positive experience, or was I just running like a chicken without my head and exhausted? Um, did I have enough help? Should I have had a cousin or, an, or my sister with me running the play date because one adult was not enough? How was the fit with the peer? Was this a nice peer for my child? Or were, were there some kind of sneaky bullying behaviors or making fun of or sneaking off to say something mean or take something away from my kid? Was it easy to arrange things with the peer's parents? So if that's the only kid who will come over to your house right now and their parents are difficult, you're stuck. But let's say you have a choice and that parent was really difficult, then you could think to yourself, well, I'm going to try this other person because she's my friend and she's making it easier for me to have a play date. So here I'm sending you to, I believe this book is from the Kegels. Yeah, it's Pivotal Response Treatment. And um, it, it used, they used to have a little booklet that was only like 15 bucks called Play Dates. It had a really basic name, but I guess as time goes on, things become more sophisticated. But this is still that same book um, from Lynn Kegel and the Pivotal Response Stream that just walks you through some of the things I've taught you and some things I wasn't able to teach you today about how to have a play date. How, they have a little more emphasis on how to do the peer coaching. So if you're not sure how you could get a peer to solicit eye contact or interact with your kid, they have some really nice suggestions for that in this book. And with that, I want to wish all of you wonderful, wonderful play opportunities for your children, and thank you for spending time with me today. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that wonderful presentation. Now we're going to switch over to the question and answer period. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to ask your question yet, we're still taking the questions through the question box on the left side of the slides, so feel free to type in your question at any time. Now, we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible, but we can't guarantee that you'll get an answer to your specific question. 
So without further ado, let's start the question period. Hi, everyone. We've already received a couple of really great questions. Uh, I will start asking Leslie these questions, and if you have any more, just feel free to type them in at any time. So, Leslie, our first question of the night. Uh, my child doesn't seem interested in playing with other children. How can I encourage him to take part in play dates? Okay, I think that uh, that's a really great question, and I guess I want to stop for a minute and say uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to the webinar and how delighted I am to be here with you tonight. So um, when a kid doesn't really want to have play dates, a lot of times what's lying underneath that is anxiety. And so not giving up and continuing to do really short play dates where they work out is a really good way to get your kid over some of that anxiety. Making sure that some of their favorite activities don't come out at other times but are present during the play date. Uh, like, for example, if you have a kid who likes dinosaurs but he wants to play with them all by himself, you can bring out extra dinosaurs that he doesn't ever see that come out when other kids are there so that you're using this thing called Pavlovian conditioning or pairing by pairing the play date with highly preferred activities to try to generate interest. And the other thing I want to assure you is that is not unusual. So don't feel badly that your kid at the beginning doesn't really show an interest in play dates. Autism comes with a boatload of social anxiety for most of the kids who have it. And so it isn't that surprising. Another thing is OTs might say having some really uh, nice sensory activities that are pretty quiet might really help that kid. So, for example, drawing letters with shaving cream on a tray. If everybody has their own tray, it's the same sensory activity your kid loved doing by himself, but there's another kid there and we're getting used to the other kid. And lastly, I want to say having other kids hand highly preferred items to your kid during a play date is a wonderful way for them to go, oh, I'm going to look at this kid because he's handing me a gummy bear or he's handing me the yellow crayon or he's handing me something that I want. So we don't see the other kid as we see our siblings as always in a lockdown drag out battle for resources, parent attention, who's got the better toy. But we're trying to make this other kid who's there for the play date the giver of things to your kid, because every time they hand your kid something, they're going to make a little eye contact and have a little sparkle, like, how did that gummy bear get there? It got there in the hand of this other kid. I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, another question. Uh, if my child already has a friend that they see regularly, is it a good idea to push them out of their comfort zone in some way, either to introduce them to a new friend or have them try activities that they haven't tried before? Uh, I think the new friend thing I'm less sanguine about because a kid with autism often where they really get into trouble is the addition of the third one where the two kids are talking and they don't know how to break in. And I think keeping those two kids playing happily together for years, if possible, even if a no third person gets introduced, is absolutely fine because that can be a real comfort for the kid with autism that they have this friend that they see every Tuesday and they've seen him every Tuesday forever. So I wouldn't be really worried about stressing that relationship with the entry of a third. If you want to have little threesomes, I'd start with two other new friends and leave that relationship that's working alone. Um, when it comes to do I want to challenge them with new activities, I wouldn't think about it in terms of challenging them but I would think about it in terms of adding novelty and new st fun stuff for them to do, usually in categories that they've already shown you they've had an interest in. So let's say I think, you know, I really want these guys to go to the, pre the museum that's all about presidents, but maybe they don't have an interest in history or in presidents. That's my idea. I'm better off going, oh, these kids really like kicking balls. Let me get a different kind of ball for them to kick this time or let me get some other kinds of uh, ball activities going. So we stay in the category where they've shown some interest and just keep adding these things so they don't get bored. That would be my recommendation. Awesome. All right. 
Another parent asks, how do you initiate a play date with a child who's just learning to engage in parallel play? I think having a total parallel play date is awesome. And I've done it many times. And a lot of times, the best place to get these little parallel play dates going are at the sandbox at the park. If you've taught your kid, I know it's winter now, but you can even have a sensory set up inside your house where you've created this park thing and they're sitting next to each other and they're dipping cups in water at the water table and they're blowing bubbles or they're, or they're working with foam somewhere else or they're washing cars at the car wash table and they're not really talking to each other that much, but they're both doing the same thing and they're just going to different stations. And that is very, very beneficial. So I encourage you to have parallel play play dates if that's what your kid is ready for. Absolutely. Is there any way to build language development into play dates somehow? Uh, language development is always occurring during play dates. One of the best ways to build in terms of language development is a nonverbal communication where your kid is making eye contact or pointing at something they want or making a gesture. Like if you're playing Red Rover and somebody waves their hand and says, okay, everybody can come over and they just gesture with their hand to come over, they're learning to read nonverbal signals, which is very, very important for communication. And if we want to get them talking and saying new things, we can sometimes whisper something in their ear right before they have to say it one or two words. But my favorite thing is to practice a few new phrases for the play date before the other kid shows up with priming and then have them come out during the play date. So there are all kinds of ways that we can work on language during the play date, but the main thing is to let enjoyment be the first rule. That's a great rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> while we're on the topic of verbal, um, what would you do for a child who's nonverbal? Do you have any tips or tricks for that? Uh, I would pick a kid who will tolerate that, uh, first of all. And so the peer who will tolerate a nonverbal kid might be less verbal themselves, or they might be a slightly older kid who just kind of understands this kid's not quite talking yet. A really good example of that kind of kid is there are some kids who are really interested in babysitting at a pretty young age, and they want to interact with other kids, but they want to be kind of more like uh, matronly or whatever, and they can be very understanding about instructing them how to play non-verbally with a kid, like show them the toy and run away so they follow you. They'll take that kind of coaching during a play date to uh, get eye contact and imitation, which is the keystone for communication, getting them to copy another kid. So you can play all kinds of nonverbal games, even bippity boppity boo that little one we taught you before. There's no reason why you have to say, now you are a cat. You can have pictures on the ground, and a kid can pick one, and they pick a picture of a cat out of the pile or out of the hat, hold it up, and we all do that thing. So it does take a little stretching and creativity to figure out how we're going to do it all nonverbally, but uh, so much of social communication is nonverbal, that I've never had a problem creating a play date for a kid who wasn't talking yet. It was merely picking a peer who wouldn't think that was odd. That's the most important thing, a peer who will accept a little coaching. And you can just say, you know, he's a little shy, doesn't talk that much, but he really likes other people. You know, you don't have to say, my kid's got autism. You just say, you know, he's a little shy at first, and um, he's kind of quiet, <laughs> and just keep moving. Okay. Wonderful. Now we have a couple teachers on the line who have questions about their students. Um, what can teachers do during recess or lunch breaks to help kids with ASD interact with others better? Okay, so here again is where I'm really glad that these teachers are so devoted and uh, giving up their lunch break, first of all, to make sure that that kid's got something going on. Um, and there is so much that teachers can do. They're so very powerful. One of the things that I suggest is that we get kids warmed up before they go to recess while they're still in your class. And one of the ways I've, I've, had, uh, I've helped teachers do this very, very successfully because a lot of kids want to escape from schoolwork. 
and they're most motivated to talk to one another when they're in your classroom, not when they go outside because they don't <laughs> want to do the work. So sometimes what I'll do is teachers will have like uh, you've done, you've gotten your work done, and there's like five extra minutes before recess or ten extra minutes before recess, and they'll introduce some very simple games at a table where it's all partners, so it's not a big competition in a big group, but you've got your partner and you can do tic-tac-toe or you can do a little math board game or something. So you've had a little social interaction right before recess, and that's making my kid feel like I may be able to talk to that guy when I get outside because we were talking together just now. The other thing is that teachers, if they can avoid this thing like the round robin that's so common in schools where we go, okay, you're going to be with Mary, today's going to be your partner, tomorrow it's Betty, uh, Wednesday it's uh, it's Jacob, and we every kid partners with every single kid in the class, that doesn't help kids with autism that much because they never really get to know one or two kids. So they're better off partnering with the same three or four kids over and over again so they can get over their social anxiety. It should never be just one kid because in every classroom, there's one future therapist who's great with all the kids with ASD. But you don't want to have that because that future therapist always moves to California in the middle of the semester, devastating the kid (laughs) with ASD. So we have to pad our kid by making sure that if another kid just saying, you know what, I don't feel like being with you today. I don't feel like being your teacher. I don't want to do this. I want to go play with a boy or I want to do something else. There are these three or four other kids that they're kind of comfortable with. And setting that up with activities and partnerships within the classroom where things are more structured is very helpful. Now, let's let's walk outside together for a minute. Brr, it's cold, especially if you're in Saranac Lake like me right now. It's very cold. <laughs> but... Having a special toy box where the kid with ASD can pick a special toy so any kid who goes and plays with them, they get to play with that special toy. It could be hockey sticks. It could be a special ball to take outside where they're sharing something with whoever comes to play with them. That's very helpful. The other thing is if you're actually very athletic and like to play yourself outdoors and you really are giving up your whole recess, which... Uh, that's wonderful if you're willing to do that. Maybe you can't do that every day. But you can create a structured station. Like let's say all the kids are running around going crazy, doing whatever they do, setting up their own games. But there's always one area of the playground where we're playing something structured run by a teacher. It could be hockey skills instead of hockey. It could be, uh, you know, basketball drills instead of basketball. It could be um It could be hopscotch. It could be anything that's very, very structured where it's not competitive. And you're running that station, and believe me, the anxious kid with autism will take advantage of that to have a social interaction where they feel like they know what the rules are and they know how to do it. So that's something we can do. We can have a special toy box. The last thing is a lot of kids in the classroom actually benefit from having a scheduled person that they know is going to be their play partner that day. And many kids volunteer for that willingly so they can see on the board, you know, Mary picked you to play with out on the playground today. And it's like a prearranged thing where you, maybe you don't do it every day, but Thursday and Friday or a couple of days a week, another kid says, I'm going to be that kid's play partner. And they know in advance. And then they're not lost going, who am I starting with outside? So those are just some suggestions to help at school. I hope that's helpful. I hope those are some great suggestions. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll ask maybe one or two more questions. Um, okay. We have one where it's also a teacher saying uh, her student is obsessed with following the rules in sports and is very competitive. It's hard to make him realize it's only a game. We all know these kids that are very rule-focused or part of the appeal of the, of the game is telling other people what to do. Is that okay? Is that something we should uh, intervene in? What are your thoughts? It's a big, she opened a big basket. Um, <laughs> yet, yes, we have to help kids with rigidities. Also, it helps to have a little bit of understanding that usually rigidities like that rule following, even though some kids are just totally seem obsessed with it, even obsessive behavior goes up with anxiety. So they're more likely to show that obsessive behavior in what I would call a loose social situation, like a competitive game. So when we want to help them, we want to use a lot of humor and, you know, help kind of just redirect the whole thing and say, I'm making a new rule 
or we want to prepare them before they go out that we're going to be playing a different kind of game where everybody gets to make up a rule or where the teacher is going to be in charge of the rules today. So we can do some priming. We can get them out of the most extremely stressful situation, which is that loose game where there's a lot of competition and people are moving all over and maybe they don't feel as confident about that, but they feel confident enforcing the rules. The other thing is sometimes when people do that, they're very worried that other people will do something to them and the teacher won't come to their aid. So when you have a kid, other kids might even think that kid's obnoxious. Then they're going to be a little bullying with that kid. So if that kid sees the teacher come down hard on kids who are having bullying behaviors or unkind, that kid will feel like I don't have to take matters into my own hands because I'm protected by my teacher and therefore they won't get aggressive. So those are some things that teachers can really watch out for, enforcing good sportsmanship and kindness and kind behavior. And you can even give kids brief timeouts. If, if a kid with autism sees other kids are getting benched for bad sportsmanship, and you just put them on the bench and say, we're all, you know, two seconds, or you can put the ball in timeout for two seconds for poor sportsmanship, and then let everybody go at it again. So the kid with autism if they got a little tiny timeout and it only lasted two seconds, that's exactly what happens in hockey in the big leagues. You engage in poor sportsmanship and you are out of the game for a brief period, but they don't take you out forever. They just put you right back in so you have another crack at the bat. So those are some ways to help. Priming, let the kid know in advance, there's something special I want you to do today. I want you to let Charles have a chance to lead. I'm going to be so proud of you. I want you to let him uh, say some of the rules today. You can say, I'm going to be the one saying the rules today, but prepare them in advance and say, and give them a role. Say, your job is going to be to help me pass out the bats and you'll be the leader of that. And then during the game, I'm going to be the leader. So solving some of those things, watching out for bullying, enforcing good sportsmanship and priming. And then, like I say, getting the kid involved in some non-competitive games like sports drills where the rules don't matter so much because everybody's doing the same thing. Even if there are days when they are very competitive, having those things happen on other days so they can kind of recharge their relationships with the other kids are very helpful. Awesome. Well, we've got so many questions. I think we'll go a couple minutes over if that's okay with you. Um, I'm here. All right, perfect. One of the questions that a few people have asked us is, how old is too old for a play date? And how do you sort of modify this for people in their early teens, later teens, when you still want to encourage them to be social, what would you do? Uh, I've done a lot of crazy stuff. I'll do anything to keep kids socially interacting. Like I've had teens who love to go trampolining together. So there's just something, it's very sensory, but it's something they enjoy. And even if the peer is neurotypical and my kid is not, they get into a thing where they just really enjoy doing that activity together. And I make sure that we drive them and we pick them up and I, I add, you know, they can have a gelato on the way home. And so it's the idea of a play date is really, we could change it as we get older to saying pleasurable encounter doing something we enjoy. And that is a play date. And in fact, older people set this up for themselves all the time. Like we play pinochle, we have hobbies, we join clubs. Why do we do that? Because we want to enjoy a structured but pleasurable interaction with other people. And so I think that there is absolutely no age limit on play dates. It's really a matter of modulating the interest to the people who are, as they get older, to make sure they're doing stuff that they still enjoy and also making sure it doesn't get overwhelming for them so that they can really do it well. So they may never become a person who uh, goes in a giant group of 40 people and goes out and does something, you know, like playing uh, uh, in the park, a giant game of ultimate frisbee with moving players and things, but they might be a person who really does enjoy playing cards every Friday or, um, or going trampolining or going hiking, or things like that. So I, I think that there are ways to modulate it. Yeah. All right, so one last question for the night. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation 
about schedule books. Do you know where people could find those or how to make them themselves? Yeah, I think they should all call Antoinette and have her make them for them because she makes such nice <laughs> books. That's what I do. Um, no, what I would say is that you'll see models even in Pictello if you pick up that little bit of software and people have posted schedules online that you can look at. What we usually do nowadays because we, uh, you know, we try to help parents do this on the cheap is we go by some photo album with stiff paper that doesn't have a lot of curly cues and stuff that's just really very plain. And we just print out photos and stick them in there. And that's our schedule. Um, I've done that with notebooks. I'll just get a plain old three ring binder and put pages in it that I can mount the photos on and make them myself. And they don't take, they really don't take very long to make and they don't have to be fancy and laminated and all of that stuff. You can just take a glue stick and cut out a picture from a magazine and put it on there. The kids really like it. Sometimes they'll join in and make them. And, um, and so I would say take a look at some of the stuff online. Don't be afraid to use anything that you've got lying around. You can even, instead of making a book, you can have the schedule just on a stiff piece of foam core. So there's little pieces of Velcro or whatever, and it's just going stepwise. There's one activity, then another activity, then another activity. So I hope that's helpful. I'm sorry that they aren't already made, but I do think that a lot of teachers have posted some nice schedules online as well. Yeah, there's probably plenty on Pinterest for you to use as inspiration. Yeah, it, it might, Pinterest might get even a little overwhelming. So what I always tell parents is start schedules very simple. Pick five activities that you're going to put in order for your first schedule, and it, then you know you can make it because it isn't overwhelming. And then afterwards, you know, let the kids just play until they get tired, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. I want to say thank you so much, Leslie. This has been very informative and lovely as usual. And thank you to everyone still listening. Thank you so much for attending. And we hope to see you back for our next webinar. All right. Good thank night. You, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.